My name's Denise Schmitz. I feel like I'm really loud, am I? No. Nobody, nobody likes the sound of their own voice. Uh, okay, so I'm Denise Schmitz. I am with Newman Munson Architects. We are a firm out of Iowa, which is not Ohio and not Idaho, <laughs> in the heartland. And um, we started our CX journey about 10 years ago, um, and so We've had the privilege of presenting here at CXPS several times. We like to just kind of, I feel like this is a really great environment to just share, not an expert, but just to share kind of where we are in, uh, in our journey. And so um, that is what I'm doing today. Um, I think before we get started though, I'd like a good sense of who is here. So do I? am I talking to engineers, am I talking to uh, legal, so I know there's some IT folks here. Raise your hand if you're IT. Oh, okay. Welcome. <laughs> okay. Oh, nice. Uh, legal, do we have anybody here from legal? Engineering? Mostly engineers. Okay, great. Okay, so we're cousins, right? Architects, engineers, we're cousins. All right, so there we are on the map. Um, so our journey, as I mentioned, started 10 years ago. We started uh, partnering with Client Savvy, got CFT. Uh, I was joking last night with folks that when, when we sent our first baseline out, we were super cocky about it. We were committed to CX, but we were also knew that we were really okay, and we were not. <laughs> you know, that feedback that we got back showed that we needed some improvement, so that was a good thing. We then partnered with CX Pilots um, to kind of help us learn how to, learn how to do this. So that was a year-long engagement. And then we discovered this book. Awesome. I, you're the second person I've met today that actually has read that book. I was going to co-present with somebody from this organization. And so there are free books over there if you guys want it. We'll, we'll be referencing this throughout the presentation. It's called They Ask, You Answer. And for us, it was just pivotal to help us get kind of outside of our own heads uh, and be more CX focused. We then partnered with a firm called Impact that we're still in contractual agreements with today, which has adopted, they ask, you answer, um, they've just adopted it entirely and um, do sales and marketing training. Um, so real quick, um, we had a lot of success as a firm We'd made a push probably about 15 years ago to really up our design game and, and really became regional design leaders. Shortly after that, we said, okay, but what about the client? You know, and so from there, we've evolved to really having CX and EX kind of be the bookends of our organization. Um, sorry if I'm standing in your way. Um, so, that has been very successful. Uh, we have CX teams, design excellence teams, EX teams. I happen to serve on both CX and EX, which is really great. Um, I think it's very good. Question, uh, you have quality assurance in the center. Is quality assurance only sort of physical and production quality assurance, or are they now redefining quality as the overall customer experience? It's. It pertains mainly to docu documentation. Engineers in the room will understand. So the, the, the buildable materials that we are putting out to get projects made. So CX, is, CX really covers what you're suggesting, our CX team. Uh, this is us. We are not a large firm. So we're only about 45 people. and. Um, we take on some initiatives that usually larger firms will take on, um, but you know, we're, we like to change, we like to improve. Most, our, our model, our business model is based on seller doers. We have no BD, uh, and that will be important as we get through the, the rest of the presentation here. We've never been a, a real salesy firm because we, um, we've relied for probably 40 of our 45 years, uh, just with referrals and, and reference work, which is a great problem to have. But um, since part of our mission has been to um, really 
be in more intentional about the work that we do, who we're doing it with, so that we're finding folks that have you know, common values and we can have greater impact with them. So um, our, our history of just you know, taking kind of what comes in the door uh, is not gonna cut it anymore. Um, and you know, we hope to expand geographically as well. We, most of our work is in Iowa, but, and hopefully expand beyond that radius. Some real quick context in our industry. I don't know if engineers here can relate to this, but what we do is pretty technical. And for architects, people will work with an architect maybe once in their life. Because it's, it's usually, it's, let me say this differently, it's usually the same people that are working with architects. So maybe from a facilities, standpoint from an institutional, but most people rarely will work with an architect. They'll, they may be on a board where they intersect with an architect, and it's you know, very technical, very confusing, um, lots of jargon, so there, there's a lot of room for CX to uh, not only improve, but differentiate. Uh, so regarding the website, this is what this is all about, right? This is a quick snapshot of our old website if it would be possible to take a website and put it in your backyard and set it on fire, I would have done that. But <laughs> I did it you know, virtually. Um, like many architect firms, um, the websites are very curated. They're very you know, minimalistic. There's this whole attitude that you know, people should just get it. It's all about the work. They should be able to see what we're doing and just understand. These are literal things that I've heard my people say before. Of course, that's not how it works. Um, so it's basically uh, you know, a portfolio, and that's about it. Um, real quick, I want to ask, because I'm just curious, how many of you all, if you've ever been involved in marketing, um, your website, whatever, look to your competitors for examples. Yeah, isn't that the stupidest thing in the world? <laughs> so, so we also struggled with that. So it's like, well, so-and-so, you know, their website looks like this. We should have a page like that. It's completely contrary. You know, it's like, why would we want to look the same? But there definitely is this sameness in the world of architecture. And so stepping outside of that is, you know, that, that is, um, it's, it's a big risk. Um, so here's a little close-up of our old website. We did have a blog, but our blog was writing about all the wrong things. Um, and part of that, which we'll get into with this book uh, that I mentioned, part of that is just an inability to sort of get outside of our own heads, right? To, to see things from a new perspective. I've heard this phrase that it's hard to read the label when you're inside the jar. Um, so you have to get outside of that perspective to, to be able to relate to your, your customers. Um, also, the curse of knowledge, have you guys heard about that? You know, it's, it's like it's hard to be aware of what, what folks don't know when we do this every single day. So this was a challenge for us. Um, and so the, we came across this book by accident. Again, they're over there on the table if you'd like to take one. Um, First of all, buyers are, as we, as we know, we know this from real estate, we know this from you know, buying um, technology online, like everything that we buy, we're, we're researching ahead of time, we're reading reviews, we're, and that's, it's no different with professional services. So folks are well through the buyer's funnel before they reach out to us. So that's why our website is so important. And we have to create content that they're looking for to, you know, to want to educate themselves, again, in our case, very technical, uh, not very um, available information. So we read this book. We're like, yes, we're all in. We got a book group together with our office. 65% of people read the book and, and bought in. And one of the things it says is you have to hire um, a content journalist. So as a firm of 45 folks, that was that's a big step to add one more person that's you know, just dedicated to that, but we did it. Then he started writing and we're like, okay, we feel like we're doing this right, but we're not sure. So we ended up hiring this firm that I mentioned, um, Impact, to help us 
with many things, including sales training, all sorts of stuff. Um, so our old website was just a WordPress thing living out in all by itself. We had a sort of CRM, but not really, and they certainly were not connected in, in any way. Um, our sales pipeline was anemic, <laughs> I would say, and um, you know, knowing that we were in this point where we wanted to pivot and become much more intentional about our business development, we knew we needed a, a more robust CRM. So we knew we were committed to the content. Um, we knew we needed that CRM. Uh, we desperately needed sales training. And frankly, again, seller doers, we, I had to sell folks on the idea of sales training. Uh, you know, we know that we're selling every day, right? Even my architects are selling every single day ideas and trying to get people to buy in. But it was a hard sell to get them to actually see that this training would be helpful for BD, but also for, for what we do every day. Um, and then I refer to our website as our crappy website. So part of our engagement with Impact was to help them train us and design uh, a new website. So here's what our goals were. We wanted that website to help us differentiate. We wanted it to help uh, educate our buyers and build trust, um, creating content that makes them a more confident client, um, able to make you know, decisions better and quicker and, and more confidently and possibly John and I have talked about this, possibly be in a place where they're willing to take more risks because they feel more confident in what the process is and, and what it involves. Um, again, since we are sellers, seller doers, being able to have this website that, that they could use as a tool to help them in their process. Um, and then of course, attracting those clients that have a common mission um, and doing that through you know, SEO. And then hopefully, um, there is an hour, I forgot to mention, in our industry, there's a belief that if an, you're an architectural firm, you are either a good design firm or you are a firm that has good client um, relations. It's, it's, it's just this, it's not a client perception, it's just what our industry thinks. So it's like, oh, well, you know, the, the firms that are, are good at design, you know, wear that hat and as their point of pride, but of course the others wear the, um, yeah, and they kind of poo-poo each other, right? Like you have the design, but not the client service and, and vice versa. So we're hoping to, we've always said, why not both? Why can't we both have good design and good client experience? So we're, we're kind of trying to be the underdog of our industry also and dispro disprove that model. So back to the calendar again. So we um, started engaging with Impact to do lots of stuff. In the beginning, we started HubSpot training. They were like, we need, to, we need to get your CRM up and going so we can start capturing data from your existing website. Turns out they, they were completely incompatible. So we're like, okay, break on that. We need to start designing the website and we'll come back to the HubSpot training afterwards. So in the process, we had our our written journalist, we ended up hiring a video content production person. So we went from a two-person marketing staff to four people, you know, and we're just kind of doing this because we trust the process and they're telling us to do it, but it seemed pretty risky, but it's worked out great. Um, so on to UX. Sorry, this image got a little bit um, fuzzy. Um, you know, when you think about UX, I like to, I think this image is, is accurate. People are going to go where they want to go, right? And, and we can only hope in the context of our web site that people are, you know, still staying on our site, but chances are that they are just going to leave. If they don't get it, if they can't understand, if they can't find what they want, they may put a little extra effort in, but probably not. Um, the psychology of the brain, you know, our, our psychology and biology tells us to 
burn as few calories as possible. And so, uh, you know, because we're, we're made to survive. And so that's why people check out. It's, 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 not, it's not because we don't have pretty enough pictures or it's not because, you know, our competitor, whatever, it's, it's just basic maneuverability. So these are direct quotes from before our new website that people on my team have uttered, uh, which is, now they understand, utterly ridiculous. But, you know, it's, it's that sort of, um, the engineers in the room are probably laughing because <laughs> architects have a reputation. But yeah, if they can't figure out our website, do we really want to work with them? It's like, that's insane. Um, also, oops. Sorry, some words disappeared. The other quote was, um, you know, they should just see it and get it. They, sh they should just see it, which I have architects that st still say that to this day. This UX stuff is fine, but really they should just see it and get it. They should understand. So creating that clear path for UX. Um, here's our best practices. Um, every page matters. So making that work on every page. Um, having calls to action throughout the page. So people, this is so important, so that people can either opt in. So let's say they're thinking, okay, this is what I've read so far is good. I wanna continue my journey. Let's go a little deeper. You need to give them, the, uh, give them the option to kind of do a deep dive and maybe go directly to like a meet with us or something. You know, like these guys are great. I wanna talk to them. Or maybe there's kind of a softer commitment, which might be downloading um, a, you know, a guide or some premium com content. Um, just, uh, again, clarity in all the messaging. Uh, some examples I would give is, so we do mainly commercial work. Uh, we don't do much residential. It has to be a pretty special residential project because architecture is so complicated and people need architecture stamps to you know, do additions to their homes or whatever, depending on where you live, we get calls every single week from someone who wants to know if, they can, if we can stamp their drawings. Can you stamp our drawings? Uh, can you, um, I wanna do a mother-in-law apartment in my basement. I wanna do, I mean these just are not within our wheelhouse, which is okay, but we need to let those folks no right away, right? So in addition, what I'm trying to say is in addition to creating content that lets people know that they're in the right place, we are very intentional about making sure that people know when they're not in the right place. So we have a blog post, for example, that says, "Do our, can architects stamp your drawings? And it says, no, and here's why. That's the title of the, of the blog piece. Um, similarly, you know, who are the best residential architects in Iowa, and we do not list ourselves on that list because we don't want that. But we want to give people a direction. We want to answer their questions so they have some resources. Um, so regarding SEO, um, I, I think people can get into rabbit holes about this, but we just try to keep it really simple. So. One of the best things for SEO is to just write content that people want. Uh, so, so how do we know that? We'll get into that in a little bit. This book from They Ask You Answer um, talks, the title says it all, right? So I know we have some folks in the room that have read that book. The, the title says it all. So when we have brainstorming sessions to kind of decide what is the content that needs to be created, I start off by asking, what questions have you had lately? What has been a pain point for your client this week? You know, what, what is the main point of, of confusion? What are the questions that you have to answer over and over again that drive you crazy because people don't seem to get it? It's not their fault for ans asking the question, you know what I mean? It's, the onus is on us to, to provide that info. So creating that really thorough, educational, unbiased content and using keyword research to support that is hugely important for driving traffic to your site. Um, we use a couple of different methods to measure that. We're, we're not, uh, you know, we're not beholden to these methods, um, but we do use Google and SEMrush 
Um, and it does help us from time to time to pivot. I was talking earlier with Benji about um, sometimes it's easy to create content where you sort of go to what we call level two content and, and you skip the really basic stuff. And as a, um, as a consumer, you need to provide that basic question so we can continue letting them go down the path. Every page is user friendly. Obviously, these things are not rocket science, but we'll get into some anatomy of some pages here in a moment. And every page is optimized. Um, and just another pitch for content. Um, why even create the content if people can't find it, right? So that optimization is important, but it's not uh, difficult, I wouldn't say. So here's our new website. We're going to zoom in here really quick. It's weird showing a website in a non-live form, but this seemed the most reliable method. So one of the things you'll see is our navigation. Um, and you'll, you know, most architecture firms, the thing that appears first is projects. It's all about the projects. People want to see our projects. We know that people really want to know about services. What's, what do you even do? Like, what do you do for me? Um, projects is there, and you'll see that there's a tab about pricing. All the time, we get questions. I'm guessing we, all of us, get questions about pricing, and oftentimes the answer is, well, it depends, right? That doesn't mean you can't answer that question, right? Put the, pr what does it depend upon? What are the pros and cons of, uh, you know, uh, not to exceed or a percentage or whatever approach you might take? So there's content that is created within there for that. We have primary and secondary calls to action. So the meet with us, you'll see, that's for those folks who are like, yeah, I like what I've seen. I want to meet with them. Um, and then the, the second one is a get, get the guides. We have a guide about the process that they can get. We used um, Donald Miller's story brand book to develop our own story brand for our homepage. So you can see that our story brand uh, is starting there. Design process is something that we know people get a lot of questions about. So that made it to the homepage, of course. And we kind of you know, tell that in a, a simplistic of a way as we can. And then here's that, that download for that guide, for the process guide. Um, and then at the very bottom of the page, it's, it's important that people always have a place to go. You never want people to hit a dead end on, on their site or on your site. So at the bottom, we have links here down to our learning center, our blog, where people can go to learn more. Um, and then, of course, another call to action at the very bottom of the page. So we just jumped over here to the pricing page really quickly so you can see what that looks like. Again, call to actions are there if people you know, are ready to move forward. We've got a video that we've created to kind of answer these questions in addition to written blog post. Um, and then our learning center itself, just a quick snapshot. This is where all our three pieces of written content per week, two video uh, content pieces a week, this is where they go. Um, and it's searchable and also filterable. So you can, if you want to see every piece that we've written about process, or if you want to see every piece that we've written about, um, you know, the delivery methods, how you can deliver a project, you can find all those. And then let's not forget, as we're uh, producing these videos, of course, we're putting them up on our YouTube page. And so that's just a kind of a bonus place to, to leverage. YouTube is Google, and so, you know, we're, we need to do what Google wants us to do. And so here's some analytics. So this is comparing, this is just in the past month. We report every month at our monthly staff meetings what's going on um, with our website, uh, which is important. These people, again, were seller doers. So the people that my marketing team is relying on to be the subject matter experts for these pieces that we're creating, it's important that they see 
you know, how this is getting used uh, to continue the, continue the process. So you can see just over the month of April compared to last month, incremental increases, which is great. Over the course of a year though, this is you know, what we've seen from, from last January. So when we started on this journey, you know, they, they would show us all kinds of charts and graphs about what to expect. And I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this is one of them. This is, the, this is that arc, that exact arc that they said, after X number of months, you're going to start to see your, your visitors just jump off the page. And that is exactly what's happened. Is it, you know, are, is it because we have some special bag of tricks? No, we're just being like thoughtful and open and um, educational, trying to be that trusted partner. Are we trying to go viral? Let's face it, nobody's going to go viral over architectural jargon. Um, traffic. Um, so this just shows, you know, to me when I see that um, such a large percentage, I think it's like 80% of our traffic is from organic stuff. That means that people are searching these exact words and we're ranking on the first page for these items. And so that's why that's happening. A bit about keywords. We're constantly um, analyzing keywords to just kind of see where we are and what's, what's ranking now and how we may need to pivot. Sometimes we go back and you have to edit existing content that's already been posted to kind of match it up better with keywords. Um, luckily, that's not my job. That's Tyler's job. And then just a, a quick note about blog posts. Sometimes the, the things that you create that you think are the most, like the least sexy, most uninteresting topic is the one that ranks the highest month after month after month, years in a row. And this pros and cons of the five delivery methods. So, you know, are you bidding your project? Is it a bid build, design bid build, construction manager, all that stuff? Like there's a lot of confusion around that. And I mean, this is at over a year we have been getting these kind of results on this single blog. Um, yeah. So that gives you an, a sense of what we're publishing. And then we also track um, guides. So we have, you know, guides to kind of sustainability, kind of big picture PDFs. These things are essentially all these tiny blog posts that we've put together that get compiled. It's not quite that simple, but to make a guide. So it becomes, so, so you're, you know, feeding this content is, is feeding the um, multi-purposes. This is our, uh, just a quick peek into our HubSpot. We're the people who had no CRM. We had a, a very um, poor way of tracking leads and those sort of things in the past. This is such a, a blurred look at our uh, deals board. And then I just wanted to talk about this real quick. So we have been talking all to this point about basically pulling how we pull people into our site, right? How we're pulling people into our site. Um, but there's, our website also serves as a really important tool in terms of being able to push information out. So for example, um, let's say we have a client that's come in um, and they've already signed a contract with us. So they're already all the way through the sales funnel and we're in contract but they have no idea what to expect from that first kickoff meeting, or they have no idea what. So that's a, that's a blog piece that people can search and find. It's also a piece that we can send to them ahead of the kickoff meeting, right? And they can distribute it to everybody else on the team. Uh, so it, it's, in that case, it's not developing any business, right? But it is making a, a much more informed, client, a proactively informed client. So you don't, you don't get out of the kickoff meeting when it's done, you know, and then there's the meeting after the meeting because they didn't understand, you know, what to expect. John. Just curious, uh, in that uh, getting ready for the kickoff meeting, are you pretty much in their face about here are some of your responsibilities when you come to that meeting and here's, you know. 
That's exactly right. And even to the point where it's like, here should, here's who should be at the kickoff meeting. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question for recording purposes. So John's question was, um, how are we, yes, good again. Yes. So what, what are we communicating to them that is needed for the kickoff meeting? So yes, we're telling them what to expect from the kickoff meeting. We're telling them who should be at that meeting. Um, you know, those sorts of things. You, you know, in our work, you got to have the right people in the room. Or if, you know, if you don't get the right person in the room until six months later, then you're like retroactively designing everything to, you know, because the IT person never showed up, you know, or whatever. Because the, you know, because the superintendent thought they had it covered and they knew everything that the IT person, that they could represent the IT person. Um, so by pushing this content out, we're creating a, a, a more informed buyer, a more confident buyer. They, they're more empowered. We believe, I said this earlier, that when clients are confident like this, they're willing to make, take more risks. Um, so let's say we have, there's a, a, a mechanical system that they have not used before. That might be something that they'll be like, okay, you know, like I've seen, you've explained this to me so well through content and whatnot. Um, I feel confident in, in using that or, you know, pr materials, what, whatnot. Um, doing this, especially in the business development phase, helps you assure that you have alignment or that you don't have alignment. I would say a quick no is better than a slow no, right? <laughs> or even a, a, a slow yes. Since we want to know like who's viable, do we have alignment, and give them permission to opt out when, when they also recognize that it's not a good fit. How, I mean, here's another question for you guys. How many of you have dedicated BD folks, you know, that are, okay. Um, I've only worked with a dedicated BD person for a bit, but uh, do you ever find that they're bringing in, client, bringing in projects or clients where it's just like, nobody wants to work on this, you know? Or like, this, these people do not share our values. Um, that can happen. And so being able to make sure that everybody's comfortable with, you know, the, the, the match is important. Um, and just, you know, um, Ryan touched on this before, right? Given the economic circumstances, uh, there's a lot of anxieties out there. So educating folks so that they, that they know that we are their guide. That's the Donald Miller story brand thing, right? We're not the hero, we're the guide. Um, reducing that anxiety is great. Um, and, you know, similar to the example of the kickoff meeting, we're setting the example for every single engagement, every single part of the project. Whether the project's about to go out to bid and they're not sure how that works or what that looks like, we can push a piece of content them way, that push a piece of content to them so they know um, you know what to expect, they know what the risks are, they know what to do if the bids come in high, they know what to do if the bids come in really low, like we can provide them with all that information. And you can imagine if you're like the facility manager or the superintendent or whatever of your organization, for you to, you know, be knowledgeable um, and show up as a leader yourself is, is a really good thing. So just a final quote on that, um, integrating content into the sales process will shorten your sales time, right? Because you're getting understanding quicker um, and increase closing rates. That's what the book claims. I don't know that we've personally tracked that yet. But. So just to wrap up, I mean, I know this was titled as a, you know, CX meets UX. Um, spent a lot more time on the CX portion of it, right? Because uh, getting inside our clients' heads and, and answering those questions is important. The UX is not as magical. I hope that's not what you were looking for here, but it's, it's really more about common sense and just creating a clear path on your website for your, for your visitors. Um, in educating, we become that trusted voice. We become that, uh, 
perhaps the premier trusted voice in your industry. That importance of, especially for us, making sure that we have that alignment so that um, every project that we're working on is, you know, th this is directly related to EX. If, if we're bringing in projects that don't represent our mission, aren't any fun to work on, uh, you know, the client is a jerk, you know, whatever the case is, um, that's, that's, and in our industry, we know that's years, that's like two or three years of horrid relationships. So that alignment is very important. Win more projects with less eff effort. We are, right now I left uh, town to come to this event with um, putting in a quals package for a $1.2 billion project. So um, our CX approach to that submittal, this is for a public institution, so unfortunately they're required to go through the um, kind of the competitive process for services. Um, but their CX stuff is woven through that. We, we journey mapped, we empathy mapped that, we journey mapped the project, we empathy mapped the clients, multiple clients actually are part of this project. Um, so, you know, what's my point? So the, the, so the effort spent up front training yourself to use CX uh, terminology and and just just be in that way, right? It's it's not an application; it's who we are. And then ultimately, you know, doing more of the work that we want to do. Back to that ex thing, but also, um, of course, matching our mission, doing the work that can have the greatest impact. You know, in the time that we're here, so. That's all I have. I know it's a lot. Time for questions. So obviously the goal of any marketing effort is to get actual clients out of it. I mean, have you been able to track, you know, since we've done this, we've increased our clients on our website, or like, have you been able to track this like, actual dollar revenue to the fact that you're actually now to get into the answer stuff? No. <laughs> I wouldn't say so yet. You know, that's pretty squishy. You know, I, I mean, I believe it is. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. I'm not a very good student. Question was, can you track it? Like, what's the revenue? What's, what's trackable about this success? It's, it's, um, it's a little more squishy. Um, I will say we won a project um, with a client. So you want to talk about ultimate alignment. This, this project just wrapped up. They're about to have their open house in a couple weeks. It's a, a, a client that does, um, it's a nonprofit that does global um, human, uh, where are my words today? It's a, it, they do um, uh, climate change. They fight, they have three major um, mission points. They fight climate change, they do, um, they're tr trying to end nuclear proliferation and they are working to end um, mass atrocities and violence. They do this globally around the world. They're lo located on the Mississippi River in Iowa because their mission is so strong um, and so much aligned with ours. We're able to, you know, use our CX tactics. I'm not sure how much our website helped in this case to get this um, project, and it's a living building, which is, you know, the most sustainable project that can be built. Um, you know, that has been a pure joy from every aspect to work with them. To know that we're supporting that important mission, you know, is, is wonderful. To know that we are also, you know, putting this living building in the Midwest is, is a really great thing, too. So long answer to that question. I would say the thing we've seen probably the most is the opt-out, which is, from my perspective, is delightful. To, to, so those people know that they are not in the right place. It is really good. Other questions? Yeah. So what information are y'all translating from your website to your CRM? So the question was, what information are you transfer, transferring from your website to the CRM? It's a two-way street, 
so we can see who's visiting, and particularly if they're downloading content, um, we can see who it is that's doing that, and then we follow up. Um, you know, when they opt to meet with us, obviously we have a process in place to, to connect with them. Um, we can see like what people are most interested in. So that, that slide I showed about the, the blog pieces, it's just, it's insight. It's a bit of reading tea leaves. And frankly, when we were done with our engagement on the website design, and incidentally, they designed it so that we are completely able to update everything on our own. We don't need any outside sources to help us with that. Um, as we, that engagement was ending, it was like, but how do we read the tea leaves? Like, that's the, that's the big question. Um, and it's, it's tricky. Uh, but you can see trends. You can see what people want. You can plus provide more of what people want. You can see what else is trending that we're not ranking for, and how can we, what is missing in our um, you know, kind of repertoire that, that we need to produce that will help kind of fill in those gaps. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, so when you're downloads, you're required to enter in yep. information. They can't just download. No. Nope. Yeah, for the guides, and, and for the, obviously with the meet, for, meet with us, they have to do that as well. So we started out with just one guide, and now we have more and more guides that'll be available throughout different parts of the site. Sure. So we're here talking about client experience, but how has your UX journey affected your recruiting as a professional services firm? Mm -hmm. So the question is, we've talked about CX, but how is EX affected through our website? We're just in the infancy of this, but the, everything in Taya that they you know, proactively answer the questions applies. So we've done that a little bit on our um, career page, but not as much as we want to. So being bold and being, you know, it's just like, right, three pieces a week, we gotta manage all that. But um, being able to pro, and it's a little bit trickier, right? If you think about pricing from the standpoint of a um, employee or a recruit, we're probably not going to be as bold about that on our site as, but you know, our, our employee handbook, we intend to put on our website, which includes all of the, not only benefits, but also kind of commitments to our employees, um, you know, a day in the life. So we go to career fairs, right? So I'm constantly asking people who are attending those, what are the questions that you're getting? Because we need to create content around that. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's not rocket science. Uh, I know you're just kind of starting your website, but how much um, thought or what is your plan as far as like website maintenance and who and when and all that kind of good stuff? Website maintenance, that's the question. And it's a good question, like because all this content that we create, right, at some point it's going to maybe need to be tweaked, or we have to go back in and add a hyperlink to, you know, another article to kind of cross sell among. Luckily, it's my it's my writer, my journalist that stays on top of that, and he's great. And you know, there's sometimes when we first started out, there's probably several, maybe three or four pieces that we actually rewrote. Because when we first started doing it, you know, we we're kind of babies, and we didn't, we didn't hit the mark. So every once in a while, one of those pieces that appears in our three pieces per week might be a rewrite, because he's just not happy with that. So you know, finding that content journalist is really important. I feel like we hit the gold mine. Um, he, he owns it. We want him to own that. Um, every once in a while when we feel like we're getting close to maybe a content drought, we'll have a, a brainstorm session where we bring like SMEs in from the, from the firm um, and brainstorm more ideas. And then it's totally up to him, Tyler, to schedule the interviews, schedule the publish date, you know, schedule the review dates, and just feed that. Um, but along with that comes revisions. That, that's... 
that's the main part of our site that needs the most maintenance. Project updates and things like that, we have someone else in marketing that handles those sorts of things. That's a slower, you know, it's a longer lead time. Yeah. So how did you get the buy-in from your team members to become the SMEs? When they're designers in their own project, they have a project deadline. Mm -hmm. Do you really want to give up their time? That's what yeah, how do you get your SMEs to participate? Um, for us, it got, went back to this big buy-in that we did in the beginning. We need to, and it's, it's based in the book, I will say, those of a couple of other people who have read the book um, can comment as well. That book is not so much about professional services. So you really have to read that and, and extrapolate how you can make that work in, in a professional services world. But it's, you know, it's all in there. And one of the things that they emphasize is, is getting that buy-in early. We have talked to um, folks who have also gone through this process who maybe have a marketing person that really thinks that this should be done but nobody else is bought in and you know they end up hiring a content journalist who ends up having to be let, let go because there's no support for it. So for us, like our culture, we're smaller, I understand, but we're very, um, everybody's all in. So when we say we're going to do this, let's, let's Here's this book. Everybody establish a common language, a common understanding. Here's the expectations. And I mean, Tyler makes it really easy, the content journalist. We brainstorm what the topics are. What is the question that's being asked? You know, what do we need to, how can we address that? Who's the best SME? So we go through every week and assign, you know, use these people. Um, and it hasn't been a problem for us. I will say we have some stars, we have some star performers that we prefer to use, you know, that, that come prepared and do a really great job. Um, and then we have others that aren't quite as reliable. Yes? Um, I'd like to chime in on that, so a couple of ideas. If you don't have buy-in yet, a simple, easy thing to implement, especially if you're responsible for the website or any front-facing, prospect-facing piece, is to add an ask campaign on your website. So like, what's the number one question you have about a design build project? And then create a form which tracks all of those questions because it'll create momentum and then you're responding directly to what the market is asking. So not only do you capture additional leads and email addresses, but you're tracking what people are actually asking. Two, when you need the individual SME in order to draft the content, um, in a previous life, what I did was say, when you get a client question, just forward me the email with your response. And I'll track all of that in a database, and you don't have to rewrite anything, you don't have to do anything, and I'll organize it all. So I would say, um, go through your emails, forward me anything, you're getting the same questions all the time, and I think the SMEs identified that it would save them time, because they're like, actually, I'm asking question, I'm answering this question all the time, this could leverage my time moving forward and everybody wants more time. And the third idea that I would offer or add is um, add to make sure that you're attaching your, your request for engagement from your internal team relative to switching your approach is to leverage other initiatives that your internal teams are used to seeing. So if you have practice meetings that are monthly, if you have an internal dashboard, if you have um, an internal newsletter, attach it on there so they're, they're continuously seeing it, like it's a simple, like what questions are you being asked? So if you attach to pieces they're already accustomed to seeing and used to responding to, um, that's a great place to start to get buy-in and create momentum and traction. We also find that just, just during meetings, during meetings that aren't marketing meetings, aren't related to anything, frequently I'll be, you know, sitting in and someone will say, that sounds like a, that sounds like that should be a piece of content. You know, so it's, it, part of it is like retraining brains to kind of think in that way. Um, yeah, it, it's, getting the SMEs on board has been, our content writer's job is to make it as easy as possible. So there's maybe a 30 minute interview. He comes prepared with questions, sends them to them in advance. 
So they're prepared to respond, and then once the article is written, they have to they proof it, and that's it. So it's it's not a, a t it's the best possible way. I think in the beginning of this book, it talks about how you know everybody's responsible for content, and then you know, frankly, as I was reading it, I was like, that's what we've been trying to do, and it's it's not working. Um, and so at the end, they're like, actually, you might want to consider hiring a full-time content writer. And I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to hijack the talk, but there's also, um, if anybody here listens to the Marketing Book Podcast by Douglas Bur Burdett, Burdett, something like that, that's where I first learned about the book. So it's like a half an hour, 40 minute podcast in which he interviews authors of their books. And Marcus Sheridan, that's how I heard about the book, is because he does an interview and it like, summarizes it. So if you don't have time to read a whole book or you want to like get bought in first, listen to that podcast and then go through the book on how to adapt the, the process and protocol. Yeah. The book calls out, again, grab one. Uh, I'm not getting any, you know, there's nothing in this for me. The guy who was supposed to be here presenting with me just sent the books instead. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thanks, guy. They call out the, um, there's kind of the big five, and the big five are the, the topics that people are most afraid to talk about. So pricing is one of those. So you should always make sure you are, are addressing those big five, and then they, they give, you know, additional topical sort of filters that you can pull content through. Yeah. Um, you went over your homepage and some of the sections. Would it be possible to quickly look at those slides again and really oh. talk about the layout was really important? Because in web design, deciding what goes on the homepage and in one order is such a crucial component. And I really enjoyed the way that you Absolutely. So we're going to revisit the my little wonky screenshots of, of our website. Okay, so for us, you know, having that big visual splash was important. This is a compromise. It's a way we can get the visual splash. This placeholder is, you know, can hold uh, still photography or videography. So as our videographer gets a little more savvy, we'll start incorporating more of that. Um, again, Story brand. If you're not familiar with that, this is all according to Donald Miller's story brand. So making the complex simple, M making it easy to understand. Um, let me tell you, these call to action buttons were a big, <laughs> a big source of discussion because it felt too salesy. That's what they. If, and you know, P.S. No other architect architecture firm is doing that. <laughs> but you know, we want, we're, we're not trying, no, guess who's never going to hire us? <laughs> An architect. So um, prepare for that, I guess, is my point. Um, those primary and secondary CTAs are just really important, giving your visitor choice. Um, Why is the print so strong? Uh, across the top, I, I would, you know, which doesn't make sense to make it large. What was the theory? Um, I know it. Let me tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you. We went through, um, you know, architects. They're designers, so they wanted to design this website. So it was a bit of an arm wrestling match between the architects and um, our. Uh, web designer, but she held her guns. She's like, no. You so they are, I don't know if they just look really bad here because of the projector, but they meet the um, UX guidelines. So for us, knowing that the process is a lot, going through and spelling that out, you know, according to StoryBrand, they say you got to do it in three steps. You can only do it in three steps. So simplifying the entire process into three steps. You know, this is our homepage asset. Download. And then I didn't get the whole footer down here, but you know, there's our whole secondary navigation, another call to action. So you don't want to get to that bottom of the page and have it be a dead end. information on how, uh, 
how people find you in terms of from SEO versus uh, somebody referred me to you? Yeah, we do. So the question is, how do we know they come to us? Um, I can go back to that slide. So here. So this is our summary for April last month. So you can see that of the 6,600, 56 of those folks came from organic traffic. Direct means that somebody had a link. Somebody said, take this link and go read there. That could be from our assignment selling that we're doing, when we give links to clients to go read certain pieces of content, or it could be you know somebody else sending a link. Through our social media, referral, you know, the rest of it is is kind of a pittance, but for me, championing this content creation, that organic search is, is huge. Coupled with, you know, you never look at anything singularly, right? So that organic search coupled with the keywords research that we do and see how we're, you know, in our, just frankly, our rankings. Sure. I'm not keeping track of time. What, how are we doing? We get four minutes. Okay. Specifically, in terms of your content strategy, be it the blog posts or the YouTube videos, is there any effort to do employee-facing content, like day in the life? And if so, has has any of your uh, designers, your architects, come to you by finding a piece of your content? Um, okay. So, kind of an ex question about recruiting. So we have, the closest we've gotten to this is have um, recorded bio videos of every employee. Um, we have a culture video, which kind of is on our team's page. So it kind of, it, you know, it's meant to be employee facing. We have another culture video that's in the works that is more sort of client facing. So, um, I'm just curious because with the, the, the reach of things like YouTube and the website, I'm just curious if you're using your content strategy at all to bring in recruits and how is that working? Um, we, we are definitely, I wouldn't say we've seen results. We've, we're, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we have tried to see results. So for us, um, uh, February, March is, is like big career fair time. When, when there's a lot of career fairs that we're going to. And so we timed our culture video to be up in time for that recruitment season. Um, you know, I immediately saw a lot of hits from it for that reason. Um, can I say that certain people have come to us because of that video? No, I can't say that. It's kind of like the old days of, you know, when you would advertise in a magazine. Could you tell, unless you're putting a coupon in there, which of course, <laughs> It's not something that we do. Like, how do you? How can you attribute that direct connection? So it can be a little squishy. Um, but you know, you follow up and you ask, "Did you see our video?" Oh, I loved your video. You know, so you, it's a non-subscription-based thing. So we don't know exactly who's watching it. Okay. Yeah. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs>